So you can see here, Joe Caius at Michigan State. And what I'm saying is just my reading of the literature doesn't necessarily mean it's completely right or it's the only way to think about it. So um, I don't have any affiliations with any drug companies, just a couple of author uh, contracts with these two publishers right here. So definitions really quickly. Uh, I'm going to burn through all of this. Epidemiology, differential, and treatment. So we, we know that uh, aggression is, is really a frightening thing, both verbal and especially physical aggression. It makes people feel threatened or feel like they're actually attacked. Uh, we know it's either verbal, physical, physical, either the pr uh, property or person. Uh, and the thing that we're most concerned about in, in society is physical aggression against the person, or as we would normally call it, violence. Um, we want to think of aggression as the end result of some kind of process. And so thinking about where this all starts and how it really begins is some kind of provoking stimulus. Either something happening within a person, something happening outside the person, generate some kind of an emotional response. And then ideally, there's a stage the, the, where thinking comes in. Of course, the people that we see with reactive type aggression bypass this and they go straight to behavior. We also know that, that aggression is the end result of, uh, of this process and that there are some aggression, some aggression forms that are worse than others that are more serious. And so, again, what we're mostly going to talk about today is outwardly directed physical aggression towards another person. But self-injurious behavior is also aggression towards a person, the self. And also physical aggression can be towards property. Usually this is kind of the dividing line right here between the physical and the verbal. Once it starts getting into this realm, people get really, really scared. Although this can be pretty frightening too. What we want to be able to do is move people up this ladder, get them away from outwardly directed aggression towards people and property, get them to use words more, and then hopefully not, not even getting them to be verbally aggressive, but just using words in, in a healthier way. The other thing is that, again, as I, as I said, the, the kind of aggression that we're talking about is reactive. It's emotionally based. It's really intense, usually very rapid in onset, uh, very severe. Uh, and fortunately, a lot of times it's very short acting. But during that brief period of time, a lot of bad stuff can happen. The proactive aggression, that's really something that's planned out. People delay their, their gratification for payback. We're not going to talk about that. That's more of a legal issue. Um, in fact, it's interesting that today is the ninth anniversary of the 9-11 attack on the Twin Towers. That was proactive. That was a planned aggressive act. Okay, real quickly, epidemiology. Uh, you guys are probably all familiar with this uh, YRBS. Uh, every two years, uh, the 2009 data was published earlier this year. And uh, two things about this. Number one, the good thing is that every, every edition of this shows that the numbers are dropping a little bit. The bad thing is that the, the numbers are still pretty high. So when they looked at all the high schoolers that they, that they surveyed in the year prior to the survey, you can see here that over 30% had been at least in one fight, almost 4% of the fight leading to injury that needed medical care, uh, over 10% at least one fight on, on school property, and almost 10% had experienced dating violence. As far as other ways of looking at this, in the 30 days, not year, but 30 days prior to the survey, um, o almost 18% had carried a weapon, almost 6% had carried a gun, a little bit lower number than that had carried a weapon on school property, and almost 8% had been threatened or injured with a weapon on school property. So this is really frightening if, if you, uh, for our patients and also for our own family members that are going to school. It isn't necessarily a safe environment. Of course, a safe environment, an unsafe environment, can interfere with a person's ability to pay attention and to, and to learn. Uh, dif a different study, um, the link between violence and mental disorder. This is uh, from the um, uh, alcohol-related conditions. And this was in the archives in 2009. And they looked at a uh, representative sample of the population, and they wanted to see how severe mental illness was related to violent behavior. I'm not gonna, it's a two-wave uh, study. You can see they had a lot of people, almost 35,000 people. And what did they find? First of all, they didn't see a connection between severe mental illness and the pred prediction of violent behavior one-to-one. -one. So not, that by itself was not necessarily a factor. However, 
there were associated factors that did increase the risk of violent behavior. And the, the things, not surprisingly, that were, that were uh, synergistic with mental illness were substance abuse problems, environmental stressors, and a hist history of violence. So there's a, there's a lot of violent or aggressive stuff going on in society. So how does, how does that relate to what we're doing clinically? Well, we're going to talk about that. We have to remind ourselves continuously that aggression is not a diagnosis. It's a symptom of something else. And what are the things that it's a symptom of? Well, real common medical disorders that may be related to anger discontrol and aggressive acting out behavior, anything that, that injures the brain can do that. We also have a lot of substance issues, both intoxication and or withdrawal. Makes people very irritable and angry. We have lots of psychiatric things. Uh, some of this has already been uh, talked about. Dr. Bussing talking about ADHD, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. The mood disorders, anxiety disorders, psychosis, tics, IED, and then various different personality disorders. And then we have the whole group of the, of the ID slash DDs. Um, and the, these in particular, these specific developmental disorders have been known to have high rates of aggressive behaviors associated with them. Okay, so here we go. Psychiatric disorders. First, the disruptive behavior disorders, DBDs. This is a Canadian study, and what they did was this was a clinic where they took in referrals for aggressive behavior specifically. And so they sequentially looked at 129 children in a row uh, who had been referred. They found that 93% were diagnosed with ODD, uh, almost 89% with ADHD, almost 39% with conduct disorder. The reason that these kids coming in with aggressive behaviors, what were the reasons? And doing evaluations that they found that the vast majority of them had disruptive behavioral problems. Now, Dr. Reich asked me on Thursday uh, about comorbidity, and I went back and looked at the study that they referred to uh, the, uh, previously, and it's a real small uh, uh, citation and a big issue that had a lot of different kinds of, so, so I don't, uh, uh, they didn't really specifically answer the question, but what they did find was that 93% of the kids uh, that had um, ODD also had aggression, um, and that 88% um, of them with ADHD had aggression, and then like 38% with conduct disorder uh, had aggression. So basically, almost everybody that had ADHD had uh, ODD and vice versa. So they, 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 did, they did factor out the, the conduct disorder because, they, by definition, aggression is part of the diagnostic criteria. So to, to answer your question is, there basically it was almost the comorbid ADHD, ODD uh, kids that they were looking at. So when you see these numbers here, uh, it's a little artificial because you're really talking about comorbidity. But look at the numbers here with, with again, with ADHD, 80% uh, aggression, 27 weapon use, 28% cruelty to animals, almost identical numbers for ODD, not surprising because there's a lot of overlap between the two. But look at the numbers for conduct disorder, 90% with aggression, over half with weapon use, over half with cruelty to animals. As far as the mood disorders, um, major depression, uh, this is a study where they asked caregivers of very young children, so we have uh, uh, pre toddlers, preschool, early school age, and basically based on the kind of, of, uh, of uh, psychiatric problems that were present, they divided up into four groups. So we had uh, comorbid depressed disruptive behavior, pure disruptive, pure depressed, and then quote unquote healthy. So they had neither of these right here. And this is the descending uh, uh, order of the amount of aggression. So not surprisingly, the comorbid group had the highest level of aggression. How about if we don't have um, the disruptive behaviors and we just have depression? When you compare depressed kids to non-depressed kids, and this now we have adolescents, we can see here 70% with verbal aggression, almost a quarter with physical aggression. And this was frequent, not just isolated instances of this, and 14% to the point where they actually got arrested. And this is just depression. So again, as we're gonna get talking about uh, the overdiagnosis of bipolar disorder and using the main criterion as uh, anger aggression problems, you can see here that just depression alone uh, can contribute to a lot of uh, aggression.